Right here. I'm going to do that so you don't have to stare at yourself. Outnumber, yeah. Yeah, probably. In the hallway, I was like, well, like for a while, but every time I was in the middle, switch, I want to say, there he is. <laughs> Now, so we get the 
Like walking water boil, you can't just stare at it. You know, Thank you for coming. Um, so before we get started, I do want to introduce a couple of our new employees. All right, how about? Um, so first, Zach, will you please stand up? Thank you. Um, so this is Zach. He started at Earl a week ago. I can't keep track of time anymore. Okay. Okay, let's see. Okay, yeah, so a week ago. Um, and so he's working in the warehouse on the SAT project, um, rehousing a lot of our mineral cores. Um, he has fabulous background in history, archaeology. Um, yeah, go talk to him. He's amazing. <laughs> so that is that. And then I don't think we were able to do this last time. So, Stephanie, will you stand up? <laughs> Stephanie is a new employee at Earl, so she's working on a data preservation project, working with our, um, it's a collection of e-logs from the Norris Well Log Services, um, so scanning e-logs, identifying what's online, and she has a background in social work and a master's in library science, so also awesome person, she's fabulous, so anyway, these people, yeah. all right, there's that, um, with that, I'm going to kick it over to Ben. Hey everyone, thank you for coming out. Um, so I really liked what we did with the Potter interns last week where we had a couple short talks. Um, so we're doing something similar today. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. There we go, Oh, too far. All right, so we have three short talks for you and then I'm gonna stand up here after they're done and drone on at you a little bit longer. Uh, so we have, Three students that are going to start first, um, Chelsea Prada and Maz Faridi, are going to talk about um, preliminary work on their master's theses. And Solomon Ketsia is going to be talking about some of the work he's been doing on um, one of our grant projects. And Solomon, so Maz and Chelsea are both master's students in EES. Solomon is an undergrad still, or are you officially graduated? Not, not officially in the next week you'll be officially yeah. graduated yeah. undergrad from the geography department so um gonna have chelsea start us off here let's make sure i got the right ones here ah come on of course i can't see them now with that up there so you are here yeah. Yeah. That's where you Oh, Jason has a question. Can we applaud at the end of each speaker? Or can you, wait for <laughs> you can applaud. And you can ask questions. Oh. <laughs> right. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming out today. I'm excited to present the uh, progress I've done so far on my thesis, uh, studying the hydrodynamics and sedimentological characteristics of the Wells Cave sediments. So to begin, I will be discussing a little bit about the Cumberland Plateau. So if you don't know, the Cumberland Plateau is a large physiographic province that extends uh, down from Alabama up through eastern Kentucky and is a place of large or uh, a region of a very concentrated cave development. And this is due to the overlying uh, rivers that kind of infiltrate into the limestone and create a lot of different caves. And that includes my own project site, Wells Cave. And Wells Cave is a 11 and a half mile long cave system with a river passage running um, up through the northern end here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, right along here is uh, where the Mudlit Creek tributary uh, infiltrates in and uh, runs through and outlets into Butt Creek on the uh, western side here. And so these, uh, both of these creeks allow for a lot of sediment to be infiltrated into the cave and create large uh, sediment banks. And the goal of this project is to analyze these banks for uh, particular organic carbon, grain size distributions, and the sedimentary structures themselves. So as we know that there are there's a lot of uh, flooding in eastern Kentucky, and so these factors that I mentioned are going to be used to help us reconstruct flood histories in this region. Um, we're hopefully going to be determining any human influence as well. 
and we'll be doing a comparative spatial analysis of two different trenches, one downstream uh, closer to Buck Creek and one upstream uh, where you get Mudley Creek influence. And uh, doing this analysis will help us to figure out if there have uh, figure out these flood histories and hopefully project them out into the future. So, so far we've been uh, doing some field sampling uh, in the cave. We went out a few times this summer to sort of scout out some uh, sediment banks that could be used for potential uh, analyzation. And just last month, we were able to uh, trench into the downstream site. And here are some of the results from that. So this trench ended up being uh, 195 centimeters deep and showed a very interesting little facies throughout the entire thing. Uh, in the first half or so, we found a lot of silty clay with um, uh, a, some lenses of fine sands. And interestingly enough, we did see uh, some evidence of finding upward sequences, which could be indicative of floods. And further down, we did we did find an unconformity, which could um, be a period of quiescence or uh, a large scale erosional event, which again could be a flood. And below that, we had alternating layers of sands and uh, clays. So there have been obvious changes in the uh, hydrodynamic flow regimes over here. But in order to get a better idea of this. Uh, of the flow dynamics in this cave. We will be working with Kevin Yeager's uh, sedimentology lab for the grain size analysis whenever we do go out and sample for the sediments themselves and also the particular organic carbon. And we're also planning on using Google Earth Engine to find uh, land differentiation over time, how the landscape has changed uh, land cover within the past few decades or so to kind of give a um, reasoning for like any changes in sedimentation here. And funding dependent, we are also hoping to get some absolute dates using uh, radiocarbon. Um, and we'll be able to analyze those distinct pa packages and associate them with any sort of land use change that, that has occurred and so on. Um, but that's all I have. Do you guys have any questions? Yes. Uh, I, I may have missed this at the very beginning, but where are the where where are the like what county or what region? Oh, I'm sorry. I I forgot to mention it's in Pulaski County. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I can like point it out a little bit. It's in like one of those heat like this part right here. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Of course, I did not. I wasn't explicit. It's in the Cumberland Plateau, but very, that's a very general description. Yeah, the, the bottom <laughs> chunk. Of it. Yes, over here. <laughs> also, great film in your picture. Ah, thank you. Funny enough, this was not in Wells Cave. This was um, a completely different cave, but it's very cool. <laughs> okay. Yes. Sort of related. Is the cave on private property or is it in David Boone? Uh, actually, it's a it's a National Speleological Society preserve. Uh, it it was a private property up up until about two thousand eight, and then the uh, NSS acquired it, and so uh, they have like a prop, like a manager there that we kind of work with, and I just let them know, oh, we're going into the cave and we'll be sampling, but. We also make sure uh, the trench is still there, but uh, since we still need to be doing our samples, but I let him know that we'll be making sure that there's not going to be super, like a lot of um, uh, disturbance to the cave itself. But yeah, so we, we work with him. His name is Bob Ross. He's very cool. <laughs> Part of the cave is actually under Danny Boone property as yes, well. Yes, that's true. It's under what? Under the Danny Boone National Forest. Okay. Oh, cool. Thank you. to go away and all right. all right hello everyone uh as ben mentioned before my name is maz faridi i'm a second year master's student working for him and just want to give you a quick update on my thesis which is looking at microplastic contamination in car systems across the state so in case you didn't know, microplastics are an emerging contaminant that are generated by uh, the breakdown of plastic in the environment. Um, and there is a ton of research on microplastic contamination in surface streams and lakes and, ocean, and the ocean, but not too much on the degree of contamination in karst. And so 
what my project kind of focuses on is not only looking at contamination uh, in springs and karst groundwater across the state, uh, but also uh, I want to start asking questions and kind of start looking at if there are relationships between the contamination we're seeing in the groundwater and the upstream landscape and uh, anthropogenic um, like human activity up top. And so uh, my, uh, my hypothesis uh, looks at uh, how land use, uh, if as land use increases from a remote to a more urban setting, uh, or if population density is higher, uh, environmental factors such as sinkhole and stream density increases, I expect to see greater uh, microplastic uh, contamination. And so what I've done so far for my field co uh, collection is I've chosen 30 springs and cave streams within uh, delineated karst uh, groundwater basins and uh, collecting water samples from them. And of those 30 springs and cave streams, I've selected uh, 12 associated caves uh, and collecting sediments uh, to have sort of a pairwise relationship between some of the springs and the caves. And uh, the fun part of my field work is I've gotten to go uh, all over the state and see some really beautiful landscapes. Um, water sampling, I collect uh, two liters of spring water in these glass jugs. And for sediment sampling, I've been collecting 300 grams of the top one inch of sediments uh, that represent recent deposition. So uh, very close to streams that would deposit these sediments uh, when you get like a storm event uh, and flood event. While I'm collecting my sediments and my water samples, I'm taking ancillary data such as discharge measurements, pH conductivity, um, as well as taking additional water samples for cations, anions, and dissolved organic matter fluorescence. And so what I hope to do is pair my concentration of microplastics with uh, these data and uh, incorporate into the models that I'm building. And so thing is covered. Um, what I've done so far is with my two liter water samples, I go into the lab and I filter them on 0.45 micron uh, filters, and then I dry them in the oven and take a look at them under a stereo microscope at 45X. And here's kind of a close up. I uh, My filters are gridded, so I, I go cell by cell, uh, taking a look at what kind of particles that I'm seeing. And I'm writing down uh, the particle sizes, the shapes, and the colors uh, according to this classification system created by Crawford 2014. Um, this report also uh, notes how to differentiate plastics from, say, sediments um, and um, uh, sediments and uh, other debris that wouldn't be plastic. And so with some preliminary data, oh, uh, I, there's supposed to be a little more the saturation isn't the best, but um, I've designated some of my sites as urban land use, agrarian land use, and remote. And all this is is sort of a spectrum of low to high kind of human uh, development, land development. And uh, based on what I have right now is my urban sites, they average about almost double uh, microplastics per liter of water than my agrarian and my remote sites. And all this means is that maybe land use could be a good factor when considering, uh, when trying to uh, model or predict where to find the greatest microplastic uh, concentration. And so my next steps are completing my summer sampling. I've got seven more sites to go, completing my sediment sampling, and then quantifying the water samples I have. Uh, and then as I moved in, uh, move into the semester, uh, processing my sediments, uh, performing some geospatial analyses on the upstream basins of these springs, uh, and taking a look at those factors I mentioned in the beginning. And then towards the end of the semester, I'll be going back for a second round of water sampling uh, to get more uh, data. And then I'll begin some statistical modeling, taking a look at all of that data and comparing it to the microplastic uh, concentrations I've seen. And with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, the many wonderful people and uh, groups that have helped me with my research so far. Um, and with that, thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. Yes. 
Do you know if the breakdown of the plastic is mainly physical or chemical or both? It's mainly physical with a little bit of chemical due to like UV um, interactions, but it's primarily mechanical. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason. Um, with your later sampling, like what type of tones were you trying to press? Uh, I'm trying, I'm, uh, that's something I'm going to examine. Um, basically, I'm uh, sampling all my springs at low flow conditions, so I'm trying not to get storm events, which might be diluting the concentration. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. This is a non-scientist asking a question or a scientist. So I really hope this isn't stupid. No. But... So I'm assuming there's lots of plastics in your lab. Yes. So how do you control for all the plastic to make sure that you're not introducing them to the samples? Because I would assume that like, I mean, God, I think I'm wearing polyester and there's plastic everywhere. Yes, yes. So uh, this is a slide I cut out just due to time, but so that's really important. Um, your clothing fibers, aerial stuff. Um, I want to make sure that I'm not contaminating my samples. And so, um, how I do that is I'm filtering my samples uh, covered. I'm examining them covered. Um, my glassware that I'm collecting my stuff in, um, I have this elaborate washing process to uh, make sure that I'm properly cleaning, uh, that there's no particulate debris in my sampling bottles. And then um, this is actually one of my problems early on in the process, the DI water I was using, the two systems, they both, when filtered, generated a ton of uh, particulate matter that looks a lot like the plastics, the microplastics I'm looking at. So I needed to switch over to a glass distilled source, which was relatively cleaner so that the uh, background contamination wasn't interfering with the environmental stuff. Yes, Jason. You do lab work in the whole lenses? No. Uh, <laughs> That's a that might be a good idea, but no, I uh, we we've, we've got cotton lab coats, so yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, good point. I think one of the really fun parts about this project is there's not a standard method to do this. Yes, there's plastic in everything, and so Moz has been spending a lot of time in the lab just looking at slides of you know what happens if I do this, what happens if I do that, and to kind of develop these methods and talking with other people that are that are, that are doing the same thing. So it's a huge problem because even our most, you know, the glass distilled water still has 714 pieces of plastic in it. So it's all relative. Any other questions? Oh, cool. Thank you so much. All right. Let's see if I can get rid of this. There we go. All right, Mr. Solomon. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Solomon Nketia. I'm uh, undergrad student from the University of Kentucky. This summer, I work with Ben Tobin on a very, very interesting um, subject. Um, groundwater vulnerability mapping in carbonates, cast aquifer. Um, using the COP method, focus on Tondoman area. First of all, what is COP? COP is a um, concentration of flow, overlying layers, and precipitation. This method is used to calculate how vulnerable under groundwater in within um, cast aquifer is. Um, I'm sure all of you here um, uses water in your house daily. Um, therefore, water is very, very important. But caustic water is among the widely most used um, source of water in the world. And um, Kentucky has a lot of um, caustic terrain. And um, I'm sure we get our source of water from these um, cast areas. Um, so, so that one is located in a uh, Gary County within Kentucky, uh, the um, circle yellow portion over there, that's where Tondoma is, Tondoma Nature Preserve. So talking about um, COP, 
this map you're looking at is um, the O part of um, COP. Um, the O is again overlying layers. Um, this overlying layers have two components. It has soil and lithology. The soil you, um, checks or we calculate um, the texture and the thickness. Lithology checks on um, the lithology type and the thickness. During this calculation, you can tell the tundoman area um, has a protection. Uh, the CO, oh, the O factor has a protection value. What it does is that the protection value protects groundwater from contamination. The protection value, as you can see, the score, the O score and the protection value, one is very low, two is low, moderate, high, and, and very high. So this is the result we got for um, tundoman area. Has a, like a varied, Result we have low, moderate, high, and very high. You can tell that there's a lot of um, highs in it. Um, this is the C factor of um, COP. The C factor serves as a reduction of protection. What it does is um, that this factor reduces the protection that O factor provides for groundwater. So C factor, as you can see on the map, has a lot of um, very high and high um, reduction of protection. So it's like cost 90, right? O factor is protecting it and the C factor is reducing all the protection that the O factor gives, all right? Um, move on to the P factor. P factor also does the same thing. This factor is a um, reduction of protection. It measures the quantity of rain or precipitation. So if you look at it, there's the scores here and a reduction of protection. Uh, so normal area, when we calculated, we use raster calculation, we got um, one, which is a very low uh, reduction of protection. Now, to get the COP index or to get a COP vulnerability score for Tondoma area, we gotta like multiply this or add them in um, a GIS using a raster calculator. When we did that, um, this is how we got, this is the COP map overall. You can tell that, um, we have a vulnerability class that's very high, high, moderate, low, and very low. You can tell here, um, this is original. Um, let me use there. Yep. So this is the scores here. We have zero to 0 0.5, which is very high, and which is like red. So the so normal area here has a very, very, very high um, vulnerability score. What it means is that, um, this area is vulnerable. Uh, the groundwater within the castle covers in that area is very, very vulnerable to contamination. Um, since we all use water, and I don't know if I may ask you guys a question. Um, do you guys, do you, everybody lives in Kentucky? Yeah, so do you know where the source of water that you, you use in your house comes from? Yeah, so if it comes from these areas, it could be contaminated. You know, because their vulnerability or how vulnerable it is to contamination is high. Yeah, so I will end it here. And I'll show you some pictures. This means the caves climbing up. Yeah, now doing some water sampling with the other crew. Yeah, um, dye tracing here. And uh, yeah, that's it. I'll hope you prefer. Okay. This um just cast area. Just being a limestone right? Yeah, just all limestone. But it is that um so the COP is like just like a, we have different types of ways to um check how vulnerable and groundwater is. So the COP is what we use. It has three factors. We have the C, that's a um, for concentration of flow. So it measures the um, uh, distance to sinking stream, distance to sinkhole. So how big or small it is, and how the concentration of flow is. So all these factors are used. We, um, we have the O. O is a um, O factor that's overlaying overlying layers. So like layers like soil, soil types, um, lithology. General geology, 
yeah, that cell has a protection value. It's supposed to protect groundwater, right? And um, can you go back to that map that shows? Okay. Yeah. Why is that so uniform? I see a little bit of variation, but it's yeah. So this area, yeah, I understand. So this area, but because it's uniform, it's uniform because we had a um, a score of very low score, which is like three. Zero to zero, uh, two point one, and um, that's why all this area had that score. Now, if you look at this area, here, it has a little bit of um, that is zero point two to zero point four. You that is what it is. Um, that is the score. That is it. We didn't. It's no higher than that. Oh yeah, it's no higher than zero point four. That's why it's like that. So, um, can you go to the next slide? <clears throat> so it's one of the big pieces, right? Is the distance from sinkholes. And so the model uses 500 meters, right? Is that? Yeah. So really what that, is five that just shows is that most of this landscape is within 500 meters of a sinkhole or is it 100 meters of a sinking stream? So that's really what that is showing. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And I'll talk more about that too. I'm just going to talk more about that one. For the O part, how did you combine soils and geology into one map, or did you, did you do that? Yeah, so uh, what we do is uh, the area, we have soil, lithology, not geology, lithology. So we look at the factors, lithology, how thick it is. Then we, it has a score that will give you. So if uh, the lithology type is uh, gravels and sandy, you look to give you a score. That you use, you get a thickness by checking the quadrangle where it is, and you follow the COP method. It has a calculation. I should have shown that, um, but you follow that calculation, then you get a score for it. Thank you. So I'm going to actually cut off some of those. Let's see if I can. Find mine. There it is. Uh, the conversations about the COP stuff. I'm going to dive into more too. Um, so, if you guys have more questions, we can talk more about it. Um, come on. There we go. So, uh, Solomon's COP model for the Tom Dorman Preserve um, is a you know, one of these types of index models for groundwater vulnerability. And I'm gonna be talking some more about this here and kind of some modifications that we can play with. Um, but first I want to start off with what these things are. They're really kind of basic index models. You take a bunch of data and when you're talking about groundwater vulnerability, it's really these three factors. It's how much water do you have? How's that water getting into the ground? And how's it moving through the ground? So you can take any set of measurements that you can think of that deal with one of those three things. I've just listed a handful of them here. And then you create index values. So for soils, like you were just asking about, uh, Matt, you can end up saying, all right, if it's a sandy soil and it's this deep, it gets an index value of one or zero or five, whatever your index is, right? So you create these indexes and then you decide how to combine your index for your soil with your index from your geology. Uh, so that's kind of the overall process with these. Uh, and I think the people that make these are very dramatic people in general. They have amazing acronyms, right? So this is one, one of the original ones that I learned about, Drastic. Uh, it combines a series of you know, what is that, eight layers, seven layers, that all spell out the word drastic um, to create a vulnerability map. Uh, epic, that's another one that's exciting. But, you know, an amazing one right here. God <laughs> is another model, right? It's, uh, yeah, we love our acronyms. Uh, the one that we've kind of been playing with is the COP model. And this is, so, it is somewhat compl complicated. So like the stuff that Solomon was talking about is really, the, but the O factor is all of this right here. And so it's really formulaic. You have, you know, with your soils, which is this top part here, uh, you have 
your soil composition and your soil depth, and you combine those, and that gives you your index. With your geology, they have a whole list of kind of generic geologic lithologies here. And then you kind of multiply that by your thickness of it, and that gives you an index value. Um, and so all that gives you that score. Uh, but again, um, it all comes back to this kind of basic sets of questions. And so in this case, they're using flow concentration. So how easy is it that water moving into the ground? Overburden, how is it moving through the ground? And precipitation, which is kind of that overall how much precipitation, how much water do you actually have in the system? Um, and so again, just kind of with that idea, the O is looking at what's happening between the surface and getting into the, the water oh. table. The C is what's happening on the surface, and the P is just what's coming in. Um, and as Solomon kind of laid out, it's kind of pretty straightforward. You have the C value, which is um, how concentrated your flow gets. You have the O value, which is your kind of overall protection. You multiply those together, two together. And in our case, we generally only have one precipitation value for an area. Multiply those, and that gives us a final map like the one that Solomon was showing. And so over the course of the summer, we've kind of tested this in a bunch of different areas around the state. Um, these are two. This is one um, along the, the Cumberland Escarpment. This is one out in, uh, I think it's in Taylor County. Um, the home place on the Green River is a site that we've worked at in the past right over here. Uh, and you can see kind of a couple examples of what these basic models look like. And these are great. They're kind of basic tools. Um, you can, once you figure out all of the uh, GIS sides of it and pull all the layers together and get all those indexes created, this is pretty easy to do. You can just plug and play um, once you have those indexes. Uh, takes a while to get to that point sometimes, but uh, these are very basic. And because these are indexes, it allows us to start thinking about, well, what else can we do with them? Can we modify these to be more applicable to us rather than more general? And this is one thing that is amazing about us. We have a lot of data. So there's a lot of things that we can consider um, putting into a model like this to modify it from these kind of original indexes. So um, I'm going to talk about a few sets of data. So these are things that we've just been collecting. So some basic hydrogeologic inventories and karst systems going out and finding sinking points and springs, sinkholes, caves. Uh, we've been going into caves and finding uh, some aquatic biology information to give us an understanding of how these systems may be connected, what habitats look like. Uh, cave maps and inventories give us ideas of what these actual flow paths that that water is moving through the groundwater system are. Um, and then kind of some of our more tried and true methods of actually going out to springs and monitoring water flow, water quality data that all gives us insights into you know, how these systems are behaving. And so all of these things are things that we can potentially use to modify this model. So I'm going to talk about two uh, modifications here uh, today. So one is a modification to that concentration flow. And another is a modification to the precipitation component. Um, and at the end, I'll talk a little bit about things we can potentially do with the uh, that overburden piece that are pretty exciting. So that concentration of flow, it is all about uh, how that water is getting into the ground. So the basic model, right, is just distance from your sinkholes, distance from sinking streams, how steep the landscape is, how easy is it for water to get into the ground. Um, well, this is um, something I've been thinking about a lot over the last couple of years. One of my former undergrad students just got this um, work published where he was using cave entrance data along with a bunch of landscape scale predictors to create a probability map of where cave entrances should be. Um, so if you put on some really fuzzy glasses, cave entrances are really the easiest places for water to get underground, right? Those are the biggest openings and potentially the easiest place for that water to accumulate and flow into the aquifer. 
So really what he may have done here in creating this model, uh, let's see if I have it on here. Yeah, so in creating this model, he's created a probability of the places that water is most likely to sink into the ground. And what's really interesting is the main variables in this model here. So what we're looking at here, the map is your probability. So red is highly probable that you have a cave entrance, the darker the blue, the lower likelihood you have of having a cave entrance. Um, but for today, the interesting part is the probability is really driven by the distance from sinkholes and the distance from springs and your slope. So these three variables listed here. So these um, graphs here are your uh, probability of a cave entrance and your distance from that feature on your sinkholes and your springs, and then your slope, it's as the slope increases, the probability of a cave entrance being there increases. These are the same factors that are used in the COP model, but are actually more specific to our location. Uh, and so we can take this probability map, index it, and that index is now your concentration of flow. So if we do that, um, in this case, we're going to look at, this is Cove Spring in Frankfurt. So using the basic COP model, um, this is more or less what your um, C factor would look like. You have your sinking streams, which are kind of these center lines here, and you have buffers around those. So you have, as you're close to those, you have uh, a very low index for the protection that is provided to that area. Uh, and what's kind of hard to see on here, these darker circles are actually your rings around your sinkholes. And so you get this kind of um, fuzzy picture of where things are vulnerable, whereas over here, it does end up actually tracking your sinkholes, your stream channels a little bit more accurately. And so when we apply it to a model, we end up over here with the standard model where you have a lot of this very high vulnerability versus a um, modified model here that has more high and less very high, but the very high is much more focused. Is one more accurate than the other? I have no idea. These are index models. They're relative. And so for me, this is a question of what's more valuable for you know, living on the landscape? Is it more valuable to just say the entirety of the southern part of um, Frankfurt is very high? And so, you know, mitigations associated with that would be, you know, don't build on it. Or is it better to focus on specific areas that are of even greater vulnerability within that? Um, I don't have an answer for that. This is just kind of playing with the data to see um, what we can look at here. Uh, so then the other modification I wanted to talk about was precipitation. Uh, while we do have a fairly even distribution of precipitation across seasons, we have differing responses to precipitation in our car springs um, based on leaf on versus leaf off season. So if we have the trees and vegetation out, evapotranspiration actually plays a big role in how a spring responds compared to when you don't have that. And the example here, this is at the um, home place on the Green River. Uh, this is data from a few years ago where we see a storm event. So on your right here, this is a summer storm event. And we have on the top here, here's our rain. And if you go down to the bottom here, you have a very peaked response that then drops off quickly. Whereas in the winter, during the leaf off season, we have a storm event here and we see a rapid rise in discharge and then it kind of gradually decreases over time. So we have very different ways that this aquifer is responding depending on the season. So this model, the original model basically takes your annual averages and looks at that just across um, the area, well, we can start thinking about this temporally. So we can split this into a leaf on versus leaf off season and see if there's any differences in 
vulnerability to the groundwater and the season, depending on the season. And theoretically, there should be, right? Because if your hydrology is responding differently in different seasons, the ability of contaminants to be moved will vary with that. So um, applied that to that general concept to, uh, this is again, the home place on the Green River, and we can see some slight variation. So we have kind of the basic model right here in the middle. The, wind, the winter model is down here, and the summer model is up here on the upper right. Um, and in general, we see increased vulnerability in the winter with some decreased vulnerability in the summer. And that's mainly because it takes, at least my assumption there is that's mainly because in winter, it will take a smaller storm events to cause a response in the system. So a smaller storm storm event can mobilize contaminants into the aquifer in the winter as compared to the summer. Uh, so this is really fun stuff. It's really kind of a fun way to start thinking about groundwater contamination, the data we have. And there's a lot of other data that has potential to give us some more insights into this. Um, so one, we've just been using the COP model. We can compare between these different models and think about what it is that they're actually telling us. Um, I've never used the God model, but that sounds kind of fun. Uh, with all of the 3D geologic data that we are creating, that has potential to give us greater insight to this because if we have units that are pinching out within the subsurface, we can actually try to factor that into these models. Uh, we can also, I'm really excited about the bio hydro work that we've been doing. And I think there's ways of showing how systems are actually connected in the subsurface and include that into these models. Uh, one that I'm showing here, this is a cave map along with some cave resource inventory data showing the blue dots on here are places where we actually have active flow from the, um, unsaturated zone flow. So we have drips, we have waterfalls coming from the surface into the cave. Whereas in yellow, these are places where we have uh, modern gypsum deposits, a sign that there's no water in those areas at all. And so we can incorporate where these water locations are into our model and kind of create a buffer around those and index around those. And then finally, I think there's some, with you know, a lot of the discussions about changes in precipitation patterns, that's gonna have an influence on the vulnerability of the groundwater systems. And so that's something we can also implement into these models um, to see what that's gonna do for groundwater vulnerability. Uh, and so that is, my whirlwind, uh, but if you guys have thoughts, questions, happy to chat about it. Okay. Sweet. Okay. Um, so we should get together and do a map at some point. Uh, there's a lot of overlap and like modeling problems. Mm -hmm. Overcome um, that I don't think we could tell each other. Uh, like I like your winter um, summer thing. Like we talked about doing that with landslide risk between mm -hmm. like day um, rush hour traffic and night because people are either in city or on freeways right now. Yeah, it's pushing the risk. Right. Yeah. So that's like a time kind of idea. That's a whole another piece of the risk that you can incorporate in here that I didn't even touch. But yeah. Right. Yeah, that and um, the other thing I was going to suggest was I don't know how good your locations are, but if you take all of your sinkholes and cave entrances and use those as feed points and identify your upstream catchment and then use like a inverse distance weighted curve, I don't, I don't know where you would get your curve from, but instead of just saying within mm -hmm. 500 meters, you have like a, a weighted curve. Yeah. That would get rid of a lot of the the choppiness of these mm -hmm. model and make yep. it look a little more because we spent a lot of time arguing about how to make our land cell map maps look realistic. Mm -hmm. And that's like a huge problem. Like we yeah. spent hours discussing that. Yeah. Right? That's, and so, so it gets rid of some of the blockiness. With that, that's that has actually been a big conversation with those mo 
especially with this model, mm -hmm. um, because yeah, it makes sense. Like realistically, you don't just want concentric circles around right. your feature. But if you start trying to morph that without having the in the field data, especially for sinkholes, if you don't know what your flow paths are for all parts of that, it begins, you know, are you actually conveying something real or are you starting to mislead people by doing that? But I think, yeah, it's a good conversation to have. Yeah. Just to follow up, I think Kentucky just had last July the history. So wow. there's going to be more of that coming. Mm -hmm. So looking at your vegetation leaf litter and things that are influencing uh, this infiltration in the summer, <laughs> it's not what it was. Yeah. That's, um, do you have? Yeah, I think there's a question and suggestion. Yeah. Have you considered using the LIDAR data sets to map what might be actual growths to sinkholes? Because all sinkholes are the same. Mm -hmm. Some of them you know, may only contribute to soil, and so the infiltration is slower for those versus the ones that are bigger growths. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I mean, that's conceptually, that's what I was thinking about with that um, the cave entrance model. Uh, because it does factor sinkholes so prominently in it, but you're right. So many sinkholes are just kind of these broader ones that you don't get that rapid recharge through yeah, necessarily. Uh, uh, we've actually found that the LIDAR uses are really good mm -hmm. at uh, mapping likely locations of multiple swallows. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately for that paper that I pulled that from, that was the easiest to visualize the difference, and that's why we used it. But we had a whole series of them um, throughout. Uh, I think it was like two years at two different sites that you know it was similar behaviors. That was just the prettiest one to show. Yeah, it was cool. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for signing in online. Happy Wednesday.